Well, everyone, you made it. You made it to the end of our comparative religions course. And um, today we'll be wrapping up the course and emphasizing in particular, you know, what, what to do now. What's the what's what's kind of the, the point of what it is we've been doing for the last several weeks together. And in essence, it's going to tie back to this initial idea we introduced at the very beginning of our term. This idea of being alive of the experience, having an experience of being alive. We took a look at the word religion way back when, and we tried to get a sense for where the term came from. And there's no real concrete, uh, absolute um, origin of the term, but there were several that we looked at. We could take a look at religio, uh, which may come from the term religare, <clears throat> and religare refers to bind, to tie together. Can you see how this might be related to what we've been doing in our course to bind, to tie together? Can you see what religions might be binding, what, be, what they might be tying? In one sense, maybe you saw or noticed that religions are, are, are about binding people together, binding or tying communities together. Maybe in another sense, you saw religions as tying us to to uh, uh to the greater world binding us having us helping us relate to all of that which is around us hmm. maybe you could see religions as tying people to things that are valuable binding us to um to what's important in life right because maybe oftentimes we're separated from that maybe the term religio stems from Relegare, which refers to again and reading, so to read again. Can you see how what we've been doing in the past for the past several weeks might refer to reading again, seeing again? In many ways, religions are asking us; they're knocking on the door to allow us to go outside our normal our normal perceptions, to look beyond our our conventional eyes in order to see the world anew, right? In order to see it again, perhaps. More modern definitions of religion tell us that religions are about having respect for what's sacred. And as we learned about last time, this is really just about having respect for what's important to us, having respect for what's valuable to us. Because oftentimes we don't focus on it, and oftentimes we kind of ignore it. And we don't give it the respect that it deserves in our lives. And as a result, sometimes we stray off and we do things and behave in ways that, you know, we don't really value. Uh, more modern definitions of religion also include having reverence for awe. You know, awe are those moments when you're kind of just captured by the experience or you're overwhelmed by the beauty or the magnificence or the excellence or the right of the experience and maybe oftentimes we, we don't notice that in our lives because we're so we're so used to perceiving or focusing on our normal everyday tasks or normal everyday worries that we forget to open our eyes and you know look up and notice how wonderful and magnificent everything is around us maybe that's what religions are meant to do. Now, remember, we're taking a look at religions through the humanities. <clears throat> this isn't a theological course per se. It's not a history course per se that we talked about both. It's not even a philosophy course that we did talk about a little philosophy. It's a humanities course. So what does that mean for our study of religion? Well, this is the report on the Commission on the Humanities. Through the humanities, we reflect on the fundamental question, what does it mean to be human? The humanities offer clues, but never a complete answer. They reveal how people have tried to make moral, spiritual, and intellectual sense of a world in which irrationality, despair, loneliness, and death are as conspicuous as birth, friendship, hope, and reason. So we're trying to approach understanding a religion from the point of view of what does a religion say about human beings? What do religions say about living a human life? 
because a human life is very complex. A human life has lots of elements to it. And in particular, human life has lots of ups and downs, right? It is full of irrationality, despair, loneliness, and death. And for many of us, we can be overwhelmed by these things. If we really took a look and paid attention to all the things that could go wrong in the world, it can be overwhelming. We can, we can fall prey to complete depression because of all the things that, that seemingly exist on a, on a razor's edge. We're one step off the edge and everything collapses. Now, maybe you don't focus on these large sorts of issues, but there are things in your life that cause you to feel anxiety, that cause you to fear, um, the, the, feel, the, fear the world, that cause you to stress about the world. And we can become overwhelmed by these things. They might not be global warming. They may not be cancer, but maybe they're things like your exams or your bills or the way mom and dad look at you when you do the wrong thing or the way your boss looks at you when you do the wrong thing. Right? We have all of these everyday stressors in our lives. Human life seems to be full of stress and anxiety. Right? We go back to the notion that the Buddha provides us in his first noble truth. And when we take a look at the grand scheme of things, you know, we're, we're one individual in a crowd of billions. We are a singular entity existing in a mob. And if we take a look at the impact our lives have on the grand scheme of things, it can often feel insignificant if you really think about it. Not only are you a small or a, 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 a tiny member of a larger society and a larger nation and a larger species, but we live and exist on this tiny planet that's floating within this vast um, arena. Uh, of space and that little tiny planet you know exists within this larger entity called the milky way galaxy and this milky way galaxy even though it consists of itself billions of stars like our own sun and billions of planets like our own earth this galaxy is only itself one out of billions that exists within the universe so the human condition is one in which if you were to take a look at it objectively if you take a look at it factually, it can sometimes feel meaningless. It can sometimes feel useless. And even if you don't take this grand view of it all, you know through your daily life that you can get stuck feeling pity for yourself. You can get stuck feeling as if life is out to get you, you know, because of the bills, because of the, you know, the evictions from your home or the, you know, the boyfriend or the girlfriend that breaks up with you. Right. Human life seems to be full of this sort of, of um, dips and, and turns towards unpleasant experiences. <clears throat> so when we take a look at religions, we're taking a look from a humanity's point of view. What do these religions say about a human life? What, does, what do these religions say about living a life like that, dealing with that? Right? And we phrase the questions this way. How do these religions make sense of this world? and our place in it. What do these religions say about how we can best live in this sort of world and in, in this sort of existence? Well, let's think back to the very first parable we read for our class, right? The Islanders. If you remember, the parable had this story of these people that had lived on this island, this one island, their home island, only to have been forced out through circumstances outside of their control. And when they were forced out of the island, they started to inhabit another island. And people so grew so accustomed to this other island that they soon forgot where they came from. They soon forgot that, they, that they was, there was another island from which they originated. So in a way, this is an island that existed beyond people's normal experience. Right? They, they kind of forgot about it. But there were ways back to that original island. right? There were techniques called swimming, techniques called sailing, 
But of course, if you don't remember your existence in another island, if you only think that your existence is within this particular island that you're living on now, there would be no need to swim. There would be no need to sail because there's nowhere else you need to go. You know everything. You have everything, supposedly. Now, from the people that have no recollection of this other island, for the people that have never swam and have never learned to sail, when their neighbor, who is familiar with this secret knowledge, starts talking about sailing and swimming and moving your arms and breathing a certain way, it's going to sound strange. It's going to be very odd. Right? Because why would you do that with your body? Why would you immerse yourself in water? Why would you try to get a piece of cloth to have the wind blow you across the seas? That makes no sense if you're not familiar with that. It makes no sense if you don't remember that you lived originally beyond the island you live in now. Within the story, we're told that most of the inhabitants within this new home were asleep. <clears throat> now, one way to interpret the story, like we talked about the first week of class, is to think of the story as telling us about religions. <clears throat> that these religions, right, these are humanity's earliest ways of making sense of the world. These are humanity's earliest ways of living within the world. But now that we're removed from that, you know, geographically, time-wise, culturally, when we try to understand these religions, it's, they're going to sound strange. They're going to sound odd. The terminology, the techniques, the practices, the rituals, they'll sound very strange and odd because we don't remember living that way because we don't come from those specific places or those specific cultures. Even if you grew up within a certain religion, maybe maybe because you live in modern times, maybe because you live with, with a modern perspective, maybe some of these rituals still seem odd to you. But as you notice, how odd are they if they, if they are part of religions that you were never exposed to? Another way to think about the story, the story was to also think about the story as a parable about reality itself. That when we take a look at all religions, they all point to some reality beyond the one we believe we are living in. That there's something beyond our normal perception of life. And if we take a look at psychology, this is a basic truth of psychology. That our perception is always filtered. It's always molded by our minds. So there's always another way of perceiving. There's always another way of experiencing reality beyond our conditioned way of experiencing reality. I mean, if you grew up with certain movies, if you grew up listening to certain songs or watching certain TV shows, your perception of how the world works is going to be tainted by those movies. It's going to be seen through the lens of the culture that you're embedded in. So all these religions point, hey, there's something different. There's something beyond your culture's perception of reality. And there's a way to access this alternative perspective. But it's through techniques, it's through knowledge that, that um, might seem foreign to you because you're not used to using things like meditation or prayer or chanting or dancing, or right? <clears throat> so when we take a look at these techniques from the outside, they're going to seem strange to us. How do I change my dualistic mind? How do I get past my rational thinking in order to experience uh, reality in a non-dualistic way, in a more experiential way. Well, you do things like be exposed to the Zen koans. You do things like expose yourself to Sufi parables. You do things like expose yourself to Jesus parables. You, right? And if you're not used to them, did you notice they were odd? Right? These stories, these parables, these these techniques seem strange. They were hard to grasp. And maybe when we talk about everybody being asleep, the notion here is that most people are entranced by their view of reality. Most people are captured right, by their perspective and how things are, that they forget to realize that there's another way of looking at the world. We can get so, and we talk about this in several different contexts, right? We can be so entranced by our everyday concerns. We can become so entranced by all the possible pitfalls and, uh, and failures in our lives that we forget to notice how wonderful life can be. Or we forget to notice how majestical life can be. Maybe when you were walking around today, you didn't realize the color of the sky or you didn't notice the, the colors of the, 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 the leaves on the tree or the flowers that were surrounding wherever it is you are at now. 
because we get so caught into a sort of trance by our normal everyday experience. So keep these in mind. Because when we take a look at what we've been doing for the past several weeks, it's all related to getting in touch with those sorts of experiences of reality, right? These sorts of alternative experiences. So why do we study comparative religion? The first is that we want to get as close to the heart or as close to the big picture of the world's major religions. Because as we just noted, taking a look from the outside and just taking a look at certain beliefs, certain orthodoxy, certain practices, certain architecture and uh, artifacts, understanding those things on their own is gonna make us feel lost, right? It'll be hard for us to comprehend. But if we can first understand the heart of the faith, if we can first get a sense for what the big picture story, what the big picture mythos is, then maybe we have a better shot of really understanding a particular ritual, a particular belief, a particular um, celebration, ceremony, right? What we first need to do, though, is see where these people were coming from. What is the view, what is the experience of life that they had? Because without that, there's no way that we can really understand all of these artifacts and, and, and songs and, and hymns and, and stories that make up the religion. <clears throat> so remember, the word myth is referring to mythos. And when we talk about mythos, what we're talking about is a different way of knowing the world. It's knowing by experience. It's having a certain experience of it. So when we take a look, when we've taken a look at the mythos, when I've asked you to think about the mythos of religion, what we're asking, what I've been asking is, what does the world feel like through that lens? What is, how do you experience the world differently? If you saw it through the eyes of a Christian, through the eyes of a Muslim, through the eyes of a Taoist, through the eyes of a Buddhist. Again, it's not about belief. It's not about believing this is that and, and, and this is that. It's about what does the experience of the world like? Right? How does it feel different? And this leads to the second, maybe most important reason why we studied comparative religion. Remember what Joseph Campbell said about the meaning of life. People say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive. That our life experiences on the purely physical as we plane will have resonances within our own innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. Myth or clues to the spiritual potentialities of the human life. Myth tells you what the experience of being alive is. Now, this might seem odd, right? Because don't we know what being alive is? Don't you feel it right now on an everyday basis? Don't you feel like you're alive? Don't you know what that feeling is? <clears throat> In a way, say, um, says Campbell, in a way, yes, but in another way, no. In another way, many people don't really feel alive. Right? Maybe you can relate to this uh, through your various journal entries. You, uh, it seems as if you can relate to this. That on a day-to-day -day basis, do you really feel fully alive? Do you feel the rapture of being alive? Or do you sometimes feel like you're just going through the motions of life? Do you sometimes just feel like you're in it as opposed to living it? So what is he talking about here? Have you ever been to a friend's house or just a, 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 somebody's house you've never been to before? And when you walk in, the first thing you notice is some sort of pungent odor. And you are bewildered as to why your friend and everyone else living in that house doesn't seem to notice. This is a phenomenon referred to as sensory adaptation. 
the psycho the psychological phenomenon is that when you are exposed to the same stimulus over and over and over again, you become used to the stimulus. It kind of fades to your background so that you don't realize it's there anymore. So when you go to your friend's house for the first time and it smells, it has this odor that just hits you right off the, right off the bat as you walk through the door, it's because this is your first time experiencing that home. But for your friends, who live there, they're so used to it, they don't realize that odor. Can you see how life can be like that? How an experience of life can be like that? Some people wake up every day, walk outside the door, and they see the world, they experience the world as being alive. They experience the world as being meaningful vibrant yet some people maybe most people when they wake up they don't experience that world they experience a world that's not so meaningful they experience a world that's kind of dull kind of dreary and maybe even meaningless in fact this seems to be an epidemic for western culture right the search for purpose the search for meaning what's the difference why do some people see this world, experience this reality, while other people experience this one? The world is the same. There's nothing different about the physical world. Well, think about habitual. I think about sensory adaptation. We get so used to our experience of the world that it kind of fades into the background. That life itself, the experience of being alive, kind of fades into the background. We get so used to it that we can no longer appreciate it. Appreciate all its potential, all, all its potentialities, all the wonderful things that it has to offer, all the great possibilities that could be around any corner. We forget that that exists here, and instead we focus on the dreariness of it, all that can go wrong, all the things we have to worry about. That is life now. That is what people's perceptions of life can become over time. If I asked you to take a look outside your windshield, right, and let's say this is what you saw, how would you describe the experience? Maybe, if you're like most normal people, you'll say things like, hey, it's sunny outside. Right? Nothing incorrect about the statement. Very valid statement, very truthful statement. Right? Very objectively true statement, but kind of mundane. Here is how a particular poet describes the exact same experience, exact same scene. The sun slides through the windshield, sealing me in light. I closed my eyes and felt the warmth on my eyelids. The sunlight traveled a long distance to reach this planet. An infinitesimal portion of that sunlight was enough to warm my eyelids. I was moved. That something as insignificant as an eyelid had its place in the workings on the universe. That the cosmic order did not overlook this momentary fact. That is way different than it's sunny outside. But because of the way the poet framed the experience, because of the way the poet contextualized the experience, he gave the experience more meaning. He made the experience more alive. And for human beings, because of who we are and how our minds work, we have the choice to do that on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We can always make our experience of the world more meaningful. We can make it more alive. And when we take a look at religions, what we see are various other peoples, various other cultures, experience of being alive. We see various other cultures way of articulating what life means like to them. So once again, as you brought up, I think at the very first week of our time together, let's think about being on a roller coaster. In many ways, life is like waking up on a roller coaster. We are born in the world and auto automatically we are immersed in this endeavor with twists and turns and, you know, uh, a a excitement and, and despair and 
thrills and fears <clears throat> if we had no idea what a roller coaster was if we had no idea what the purpose or point of a roller coaster was how would your experience of it be your experience of it might be fearful stressful anxious and maybe these overwhelm you so much that it becomes your everyday normal experience of life. But what if you knew what a roller coaster was? What if you were told what to expect of it? What, which, what if you were told what the point of it was? Maybe you'll realize that all these twists and turns are part of it. That at the end, everything kind of works out the way it's supposed to, right? that there's a purpose to it. And maybe instead of being caught up by the fear and anxiety of the unknowing, you start to enjoy the unknowing. You start to, uh, you start to engage in the unknowing in a way where it becomes fun, it becomes exciting, and you feel more alive. But that's only if you knew what a roller coaster was. That's only if somebody gave you a map to, for what to expect of it. Maybe not every turn, but what to expect in terms of what it is, what to expect of roller coasters. You, well, it's a thing where you go up and then you come down because it's kind of fun, and where you make loops because it's fun to travel in loops. It's not there to harm you. It's not there to kill you. It's there to, for your enjoyment. It's there for, your, for, for you to get thrills. But, but of course, if nobody tells you this, right, all you know is that every turn is something that could end my life. Every loop is something that could lead to my devastation. In many ways, religions are our description of our roller coasters. Religions tell us how other people have made sense out of their roller coaster. And maybe by being exposed to these various ways in which people have made sense of their roller coaster, we can stop being succumbed to, we can stop succumbing to all the fear and anxiety and stress of the unknowing and start to enjoy the experience of life. And it's by doing that, that maybe we can experience being alive again, experience the thrills and the excitement and the, right, of life, possibly. So this was kind of the goal, to expose you to various maps, various ways of looking at life, of experiencing life, of making sense of life through these various cultures, right, these various religions. It's indicative of the blind men and the elephant. <clears throat> so here is a village of blind men. And the blind men had never experienced an elephant before. They knew that an elephant was coming into town the next day and became very excited. They all started gossiping and talking to each other about how wonderful this will be. They'll finally get to know what an elephant is. The day comes, the elephant is brought into the village, and all the blind men start to experience the elephant. And then they start to exclaim, finally, I know what an elephant is. The first blind man says, an elephant is a coarse rope. It feels like a coarse rope in my hands. Hearing this, the other blind men start to grumble. What are you talking about coarse rope? This elephant, it's like a brick wall. This elephant is, is, is like a flat surface with, uh, with, with roughness and edges. Again, blind men start to grumble. What are you talking about brick wall? An elephant's like a pillar. It's like this large pillar, kind of like what we use to hold up statues. Eventually, all the blind men start to argue about what an elephant is. Well, what can we take away from the story? What is it that maybe needs to happen in order for the blind men to know the truth about the elephant? It might be to appreciate that from, from different points of view, the elephant is going to be experienced differently. That the elephant has multiple facets, multiple aspects to it. A tail, right? a belly, a leg, an ear. These are all aspects of what make up an elephant. And when these various blind men start to argue about what an elephant is, it's not because they're wrong or right. It's simply because they're unwilling to experience the reality of the elephant from a different point of view. In this sense, 
what we've been trying to do in our class is to expose you to reality from various points of view. In particular, it's to expose you to the human condition. It's to expose you to what it means to be human from various points of view. Expose you to different ways in which people in the past have dealt with the human condition, have dealt with all the problems that we even nowadays face, right? Conflict between people, conflict between warring tribes, so we call them nations and countries now. Right? Anxiety, stress, dealing with oppression. I mean, these are all themes of life and reality that we're still dealing with on a modern basis. And the hope is that by exposing ourselves to more narratives of what to do with the human condition, we can start to develop a greater sense for what we should do with ourselves in life to live it better, to live it more elegantly. Now, I hope isn't that you are now enlightened necessarily. My hope is it that now you are a firm believer in either a uh, 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 firm believer of any one of these particular religions. That's not the point. My hope is that you now have some sort of appreciation for the world's great religious traditions, not about being right or wrong, but as representing different people's understanding of, of life. And the more we can em have empathy, the more we can see the world through other people's eyes, maybe the better shot we have of living in a world that lasts. Maybe we have a better shot of living in a world uh, that can coexist in harmony. So uh, I appreciate you spending the last several weeks uh, with me, with each other, in your discussion boards. Um, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you uh, my enthusiasm for the world's great traditions, and, uh, my approach to relating to each of these religions. This is only a starting point, and I encourage you to delve deeper, delve deeper into learning about maybe, if not just other religions, other cultures, other people. Learn about your neighbor, learn about your other classmates and other classes, just to get a sense for how other people see the world. And um, maybe one day I'll see you again in a, in a live class. Make sure to say hi and make sure to remind me that we were together this week. Okay? Well, take care of yourselves and I wish you the best moving forward.